Hello and welcome to my channel. Pull up a chair and let's talk about a sketchy story while I, well, sketch. My sketches always look very messy at the start, but stick around, it generally turns out okay. Today is the first in a new video series I'm doing about stalkers. Lauren Teresa Giddings was only 27 when she died on June the 26th, 2011, in Macon, Georgia. She had enjoyed a night out with friends the night before. She was the kind of person who didn't mind laughing at herself. One of the friends she often went running with as part of the running club remembers her jumping into a small creek, hoping to cool her legs, only to underestimate the depth and become completely drenched. Instead of being embarrassed, she simply stood and laughed at her mistake without a shred of self-consciousness. She was likable. Aside from her many friends, she was also close to her family. She had recently returned from being in her sister's wedding, and she was in the process of planning a move out of the apartment building where she had lived. She was born on April the 18th, 1984, in Tacoma Park, Maryland, to William and Karen Giddings. She had two sisters and a one-eyed dog, Butterbean. She grew up and resided in Laurel until she moved to Georgia. She was a member of St. Mary's of the Mills Catholic Church and attended St. Mary's School from kindergarten to eighth grade. She remained a devout Catholic her whole life, attending Mass every week during her three years in Macon, according to the pastor there. She graduated from Athelton High School in Columbia in 2002 where she played field hockey and softball. In 2002, she moved to Georgia and attended Agnes Scott College until 2006, when she graduated with a major in political science, minored in religious studies, and played softball. After graduation, she returned home and worked for the National Center for Public Policy in Washington, D.C., before pursuing a career in law. In 2008, Lauren started at Mercer University's Walter F. George School of Law, where she was the president of the Federalist Society. She graduated on May the 14th, 2011, with a JD degree. Lauren wanted nothing more than to practice criminal law. She wanted to focus on defending those on death row, and she was determined to make her dreams come true. Only one thing still stood in her way, the Georgia bar exam. When Lauren's parents hadn't heard from her for a few days, they weren't particularly worried because she had told them that she would be busy studying for the bar exam. But when Lauren had not been seen or heard from in four days, her friend Ashley became concerned. She phoned Lauren's sister, Caitlin. Caitlin also became worried and asked Ashley to use the hidden key to Lauren's apartment to let herself in and check on her friend. On June the 30th, 2011, Ashley and a few of Lauren's other friends used the key to enter Lauren's apartment. When they walked in, they instantly knew something was wrong. Lauren's law textbooks, purse and keys were inside her apartment and her car was still parked outside but Lauren was nowhere to be found. They checked her computer for clues, and they found a disturbing email Lauren had sent her boyfriend, saying that she suspected that someone had tried to break into her apartment the week before. So her friends called the police. When officers arrived, they started to search for her, one officer noticed a foul smell coming from the dumpster outside. It was there that they made the horrific discovery of a human torso. Later DNA tests confirmed that it was Lauren. While the torso was being discovered, the media was outside conducting interviews with various people. One of these people was Lauren's neighbor, Stephen McDaniel. He was also her classmate. He had asked her out a few times, 
She always said no, but tried to remain friendly. He gave her the creeps. In his application to Mercer University Law School in 2008, he described himself as level-headed, down-to-earth, a dreamer and a thinker, and a highly competitive personality. He also said he had an inner drive to win in any situation. He said he aspired to be a federal judge, but wrote, Despite having a thorough plan of what lies ahead, I am not an overly optimistic person. His interview with the media outside was the first red flag. When he was told on camera that a body had been discovered, he started blinking rapidly and stated that he needed to sit down. Rapid blinking is associated with heightened stress levels. Because I mean, we went at, we went over. One of her friends had a key. We went inside and tried to see if there was anything amiss. But I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it. So there was no sign that anyone broke in. I mean, the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we we just don't know where she is. I mean, what about um, in the like the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of. I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body. Um, had you heard? Any, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? I. I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. He was taken into the police station on a charge of burglary. And the police interview that followed is famous for being one of the creepiest police interviews ever filmed. Just look at his demeanor and his monotone voice, which was absolutely not present during his earlier interview with the media. Okay. I need to know about this girl right here. You know her? Yes. Who is that? Lauren Giddings. Does she live next door to you? Yes. When's the last time you seen her? Two or three weeks ago. Okay. Was you friends with Lauren? Yes. Look at me when you talk to me, son. Okay? Was you friends with her? Yes. Close friends? We were good I friends. mean, y'all were friends, right? Both yes. of y'all were law students. You're studying to be an attorney, right? Yes. What kind of law do you want to go into? Criminal law? Yes. Civil? Is that what you want to do for a living? Yes. Okay. Are you almost finished? Many people have wondered why he adopted this unsettling catatonic persona. We may never know for sure, but a later interview with his mother may give us some clues. She reported that at around midnight on June the 30th, investigators called her and put Stephen on the phone. She said, quote, And Stephen, in almost a hypnotized, very flat voice, said, They told me I did something bad. They told me I hurt someone. For 20 hours, they had been trying to pressure and threaten and coerce him into confessing for a murder. End quote. In Georgia, there are two kinds of insanity defenses. One is where the defendant does not have the ability at the time of the crime to distinguish between right and wrong. Prosecutors and defense attorneys will use a defendant's behavior before and after the commission of the crime to prove or disprove this. As a law student, Stephen would be familiar with this and could have been trying to build the foundation for an insanity defense. Since he didn't confess to anything, I doubt he was trying to create the impression of a coerced false confession, as his mother seemed to think. However, his statements of, they told me I did something bad, they told me I hurt someone, seems to imply that he is not making the connection that hurting someone is something bad, and that someone else had to make that connection for him. The call with his mom would probably have been recorded, so he was probably hoping that this could be used as evidence in his favor for establishing his behavior after the crime. His defense attorney stated later that Stephen had made notes for and suggestions to his defense team, but that his perspective was that of an inexperienced law student, not an experienced lawyer. 
and would not hold up in trial court. This makes me even more suspicious that Stephen was trying to build an insanity defense, but was advised against it by his attorneys. Police found a ton of evidence against Stephen, including a pair of panties with Lauren's DNA in Stephen's bedroom sock drawer, a master key to the apartment complex, and a key to Lauren's apartment were also found in his bedroom. A large bloody sheet was left in a washing machine in the apartment complex's laundry room. A hacksaw with human flesh was found in a locked storage closet in the laundry room. The blood on the saw matched Lauren's DNA. Packaging for the saw was found in Stephen's apartment. And child pornography was found on his computer, as if he was not a piece of shit enough already. Stephen was formally charged and then arrested for Lauren's murder. He pleaded not guilty. The state decided to pursue the death penalty, but later changed their approach. They offered him a plea bargain in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table. Stephen then pleaded guilty and confessed. As part of his plea deal, he waived most of his rights of appeal. His confession was chilling, to say the least. At 4.30am on Sunday, June the 26th, after he broke into Lauren's apartment dressed all in black, he strangled her for approximately 15 minutes until she stopped moving, and then he dragged her into the bathroom and placed her in the bathtub. He then returned to his apartment and spent the entire day on his computer Then in the evening, he returned with a hacksaw and he cut up her body. I removed her limbs and head, wrapped them in several black trash bags separately, and discarded them in the Mercer Law School dumpster, he wrote. He put Lauren's torso into the apartment trash can on June the 28th. He denied raping Lauren. He said, quote, She was wearing the pink running shorts found on her torso when she died, and I never removed them. Stephen had been stalking and spying on Lauren for months. He had used a camera attached to a six-foot-long wooden stick and held it up to her window to film her. But perhaps the most disturbing evidence came from his online activity. On April 28th, 2011, about two months before the murder, He typed the Google search phrase, nude, Lauren Giddings. He visited her Twitter profile. That same morning, he also conducted three back-to-back searches with variations of the phrase, molest sleeping girl. On May the 1st, he searched for escape prison. On May the 2nd, he searched the phrase, choked unconscious, how long, wake up. On May the 30th, two weeks after they both had graduated from law school, Stephen again conducted an internet search using the term Lauren Giddings. On June the 3rd, he viewed her Amazon.com wishlist. On June the 7th, he searched for her account on a photo sharing website. I assume this is Flickr or Instagram. He looked at another woman's photos in the same day. Earlier on the morning of June the 8th, he viewed Lauren's LinkedIn page, googled her name, and looked at her Facebook page. On June the 24th, he typed in multiple search phrases researching the door-jamming burglar bars that Lauren had used to secure her apartment. He visited Lauren's Facebook page one final time on the afternoon of June the 25th, just a few hours before he killed her. On June the 30th, 2011, about four hours before Lauren's torso was discovered, he researched how to erase his browsing history. Stephen McDaniel was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. As this is the first case in my series on stalking, let's take a look at the different types of stalkers. Psychiatrist and expert Paul Mellon categorized stalkers into five typologies. First, the rejected stalker. Second, the intimacy-seeking stalker. Third, the incompetent suitor. Fourth, the resentful stalker. 
and fifth, the predatory stalker. We will break down these different types and their examples in more detail in future videos, so remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to make sure you don't miss out. The first typology relevant to this case is the incompetent suitor type. These stalkers are lonely and lustful. They generally target acquaintances or strangers. They are not looking for a relationship, but rather a sexual encounter. They are convinced that if they persist in the stalking, the victim will grow attracted to them. These stalkers generally stalk for only brief periods of time, but it can be very intense, and they are completely oblivious to the distress they cause for their victims. They are very entitled, and they can be socially inept. Stephen did ask Lauren out and was rejected, after which he developed an obsession with her. Though there is a little bit of overlap with the incompetent suitor type, Stephen is primarily what is called a predatory stalker. This is one of the most dangerous types of stalkers because they are covert, so often the victim is not even aware of the stalking. Likely, this is also the most uncommon type of stalker. Predatory stalking takes place in the context of deviant sexual practices and interests. Perpetrators are usually male and victims are usually female, a woman in whom the stalker develops a sexual interest. The stalking behavior is usually initiated as a way of obtaining sexual gratification. An example of this is voyeurism. But this can also be used as a way of obtaining information about the victim leading up to a sexual assault. The clearest indication that Stephen was a predatory stalker was his search history, which shows that he was gathering information about Lauren and was actively planning a sexual assault. The stalking and filming of Lauren was a form of sexual gratification for him before the attack. His stalking behavior was not an attempt to get her attention or to lay claim on her time. Lauren wasn't even aware he was stalking her. So how common is stalking? Sadly, more common than it should be. Nearly 1 in 6 women and 1 in 17 men will be stalked at some point in their lifetime. Stalkers are not always interested in a romantic or sexual connection. If you are being stalked, do not ignore it, hoping the person will go away. There are four general guidelines that are recommended, but each situation is different. That said, the four guidelines are do not have any contact with a stalker. Take steps to increase your security. Tell people about the stalking. And collect as much evidence as you can. Lauren's family has set up a scholarship fund in her memory. And you can donate to support this fund. I will leave the link down below. That's it for today's video. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.